Paul, it's great to have you here. Great to be uh, here. And would you mind to say a couple of words about you so people will know who you're talking to? Sure. Uh, I'm uh, currently located down in Mexico on the West Coast, uh, working with the International Sailing Academy, and I coach uh, laser sailors, uh, high school sailors, uh, Olympic hopefuls, and a lot of masters. And uh, I work with uh, a couple great coaches, Vaughn Harrison and Colin Golan, who are the owners of International Sailing Academy. And we also bring in a lot of uh, world-class sailors to come down and, and teach us as well. Uh, gold medalists and world champions. And uh, we get to do this uh, generally November through June each year. So it's pretty exciting. My educational background is uh, what is known as instructional design. I got a PhD in instructional design and performance technology. And basically that just means I design training programs and products. And the methodology that I learned is very applicable to coaching. I've used it in a variety of coaching situations besides this, sailing as well as other sports, little baseball, soccer, and so on. And a very robust methodology. And I'm also finding as I explore other sources such as sports psychology and skill acquisition, there's a lot of crossover there and some exciting things happening, even uh, recently that can really help our, our sailing coaching. So that's where I'm coming from. That's a little bit of my background. I, I heard you had three questions to ask me, Omar. Yes, that's very true. And I see there on the slide. Okay. So um, first of all, I want to say that, that your experience and background is, is actually quite uh, remarkable and uh, very different from many sailing coaches um, that we know and we talk to. So it's it's really good to get another point of view and um, listen to more to more ideas, more methodologies. So that's that's great. So thank you for doing that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll apologize beforehand here. I may slip into using some of the jargon of instructional design. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, I'm going to let myself slip and do that because I think uh, the people that watch this are coaches that are really interested in the, the latest cutting edge uh, educational technology in terms of methods and techniques that really work. So hopefully we can share some of those. Based upon your questions, uh, I, I think I have some objectives that I hope that we'll uh, achieve by the end of this session. The first Amazing. one is, is based upon uh, you know, my methodology, the coaches watching this will pick up an, I, an idea or two about some techniques that they can use and bake into their own style. And I hope that they'll also get some ideas uh, for new ways to use technology like video and uh, checklists and simulations and other ideas in that realm and then lastly i hope that uh, start thinking about coaching and adding perception training and awareness training wrapped around all of the skill training that we do because i think that will uh, boil down to more success in terms of ra uh, uh, racing and also sailing uh, fun and uh, quality of their experience. So that's what I hope will happen. Uh, let's look at the first question. And actually the reason I did slides was because I was gonna create an answer for each one of your questions, but they all overlap so much. So we have to talk about all three questions at the same time here. Let's do so that. Let's look at the, the first one. I think the core of my uh, methodology is based upon models and examples. I really don't think that a sailing coach can effectively teach or coach a technique or maneuver without having a model. And they need to be able to describe that model and describe what makes it an example, a good example. And then they need to break it down into the bite-sized pieces so that a, a student can reconstruct that and create uh, that action themselves. So the first thing that I look for when I'm trying to teach something is a crystal clear example of a model performance. 
And I'll ask you, Omer, where do you think I might be able to get some crystal clear examples? I think there's a technology answer or two. What do you think? <laughs> Obviously, we think the same, but um, I can tell you when I was doing my Olympic campaign or some of my training, um, I was actually looking for a lot of um, top sailors videos of YouTube. Uh, yeah. So that's one one great place um, to find uh, to find that. Um, another place to do it is if you are training within a team, within a squad, and your coach is taking some videos, and you have one uh, boat, one sailor that is obviously very good. This is you can share that between the team members um, and use that's that right. as a benchmark. Um, yeah. Those, yeah. those are the two are probably most common or easiest, call it, places so, to get it. Yeah, YouTube, your team, or you can do it yourself, you know, if you're actually a sailor and you have that skill, or you go get somebody else to do it, or you put the word out to the network and ask people to gather an example or examples for you. So great opportunity to use video technology, internet technology, networking technology, all of the communications miracles that we experience today, you have no excuse for not finding a crystal clear example. Uh, the next thing that you need to do once you get your crystal clear example, and you can do this behind the scenes and you should do it behind the scenes, but also it's a great exercise to do once you've figured it out yourself with your sailors. And that is to ask the question, what makes this good? What are the characteristics of this example that make it good instead of bad, or in today's vernacular, that makes it not suck, right? Right. So uh, what does it look like? What are we looking for? What are the characteristics? Does this happen? Does this happen? Does this happen? And once you're able to define what makes it good instead of bad, then you boil that down into what I call a performance checklist. And that checklist creates the basis for a, a feedback loop. And that checklist really accomplishes all sorts of miracles. It, uh, number one, creates a crystal clear description of the standard that you're going to use to give your, your people feedback. It's also an opportunity for your sailors to evaluate themselves just the same way that you're evaluating their performance. It also provides a, a common language when you're talking about a maneuver or attack. Did you do the entry this way? Did you do the exit this way? Uh, did you follow these steps? And it's a great way for your fellow sailors to compare notes and to critique and learn from each other. So you get a, a lot of miracles from that. Now, the only way you get that, and here I'm gonna throw out the, the first jargon of the day, you need to create a checklist that is also crystal clear and creates what I call inter-rater reliability. And what that means is if somebody observed, well, let's say I did a tack on a laser and a, you observed me uh, doing that tack and you used the performance checklist, you would come to a conclusion as to what things I nailed and what things were opportunities for improvement. And let's say we gave that same checklist to another coach. Let's say we gave it to Brett Bayer and he watched the video, he used the checklist if we get that reliability, both you and Brett come up with the exact same feedback. And you get an added benefit that if I watch my video myself and use the checklist, I can come to the same conclusion as you two. Now we're all speaking the same language. I'm not confused by what you're trying to tell me to do better. I'm uh, focused like a laser on the things that are going to get me better. And so, um, these checklists and these feedback loops are really what makes the magic happen. So we're looking for feedback loops between coaches and sailors. And we're also looking for the opportunity for sailors to critique themselves. Because you have to admit, the majority of the time that the sailors are practicing on the water, there's not a coach behind them. Uh, many don't have cameras on their boats. Uh, many don't have the time to review all of the footage that they get on the camera on the boat where that's where kinetics comes in right to right. Help zero in on that and Correct. so this is just a great way to make the whole coaching process much more efficient much more crystal clear 
and it speeds up the learning process. So that's really it in a nutshell. That's what I try to do. Uh, there are some other things that are pretty important around that, and that's where we get to perception. You ask the question about awareness. How do you teach awareness? Well, the first thing you do is you give them the, the checklist. And now all of a sudden they say, well, this is what I have to do to meet the standard. Now they're aware of what good looks like. Now they can use their own brains to focus in on achieving that standard and give themselves feedback. But also in addition to that, I think there's some uh, other factors that have to be baked into what we're coaching. And that's perception of the situation or context. I'm gonna move my little thing here. Um, performance on the race course consists of, number one, specialized focused perception. Now I have to confess, I stole this from a soccer coaching book, <laughs> or as you would say across the pond, football. And they say here in Mexico too, football. <laughs> but uh, this is this is straight from a soccer coaching book. So the first thing is performing better on the race course or on the soccer pitch consists of one specialized focused perception. They're finding that the pros look at the game and look at the different factors a lot different than the beginners. So if we want people to perform like the pros and be fast sailors, we also have to put all of the things that we teach in the context of where they do these things, in the context of on the water, in the context of in a race, in the context of weather, and, and so on. So we should be teaching perception or the ability to see or feel along with the ability to tack a boat or to double tack or to sail backwards or all these things where we tend to focus our attention at least on the up and coming sailors. Uh, second, we need to associate the pattern of the perception, perceptions that they see and feel with a rehearsed series of actions. So those rehearsals that we do during practice need to be combined with the perceptions. If you remove them from the perceptions, you don't get the result when you get out to the race course. And the research is also telling us that if we do the actions automatically, it opens up more bandwidth in our minds to perceive what's going on. So there's a symbiotic relationship there uh, that we need to address as coaches. And lastly, adapting and applying those actions to the specific case. In other words, what's happening during a race, making the best next decision based upon your perceptions, the right perceptions, the focus perceptions. Uh, the research also says that experts don't take in everything. In fact, their attention is even narrower than a beginner. They know where to focus their attention to get the information that they need to execute their decisions using the automatic uh, maneuvers and tasks that they practice. So I, I think I, I would, I'm challenging myself and I would challenge other coaches to uh, start baking in the perception, perceptual context of everything. Instead of teaching somebody to tack, teach somebody when to tack. And so when they practice, tacking, they're also practicing looking at the visual and other cues that are necessary to cause them to tap. And then imagine what sort of power would be unleashed in their races when they master both the perception and the action. So hope that addresses some of your awareness questions. No, this is really good. And it also means that um... When, when you talk to sailors or and coaches, when they talk about uh, their boat handling, for example, when they said um, exactly that, when they say, when the boat handling is uh, a second nature, you don't have to think about it. You can just throw in a tack at, at any given time and you know that it's gonna be good. Um, or you can control your boat and get your, your boat speed without looking into your boat all the time. Yeah. Then you can actually look outside and make better decisions because it's free as much, frees your mind to look, out, look outside um, to and look see outside. that shift. Yeah, look outside and see that shift coming just because you can read the, the ripples on the way better than other people that just don't even notice that. Yeah, and you have more bandwidth to look at it rather than looking into your boat, making 
making decision on, on boat speed and then try to look outside and then try to make a, a tactical exactly. decision. So instead of teaching that later in somebody's career, when they're less likely to get it because they've developed so many bad habits, uh, it should be taught when they're beginning to learn to attack or yeah. whatever it is. You know, if we're looking at these foiling boats for uh, LGP and uh, America's Cup, uh, same thing. The things that they're learning need to be learned in context. And you're seeing that, uh, especially with the simulators. The simulators are, are simulating more of the factors that they should be looking at than ever before. And so they're getting that opportunity to get it in context versus, you know, turning the wheel or whatever mechanics. They're getting it in the context of that perception. Great. That is correct. So let's look at the actual practice session. Well, the first thing that you need to do is those practice sessions, in order to be effective, they need to be targeted. So you need to be able to describe as a coach. And by the way, this is a test for the coach, not necessarily a test for your sailors. You need to be able to describe what the sailors will be able to do at the end of the day that they aren't able to do now or at the beginning of the day. And that needs to be observable and measurable. How do you do that? I use the performance checklist that we talked about. So that's, that's how we focus on that to ensure that we are able to measure and see progress. Now, once you've done that though, you use those objectives as a litmus test for coaching decisions that you make. The first one is you need to understand that you're designing the session to cause the, the sailors to achieve those objectives. And that as you design that uh, training, you need to make sure that every possible moment is dedicated to causing the sailor to move towards the ach achievement of those objectives. And if it doesn't happen, you throw the activity out and replace it with something else. So for example, an hour long lecture with a slideshow, it probably isn't going to change performance much, but give it a try. I mean, if you <laughs> insist, and see at the end of the day if they're tacking better or if they're making better decisions than they ever did before. And if it's not the case, throw it out and do something else. So, you know, this, this I may be shattering some people's worlds here, but it's the coach that is accountable for whether the sailors meet the objectives. And if they don't meet the objectives, the coach has failed. Either they picked the wrong objective, they picked the wrong exercises to get to that objective, Maybe they didn't dedicate enough time to it, but if you use the, the, the right approach and you use have enough time to do it, every sailor in your domain should be able to meet that objective. Now, I admit there are sometimes exceptions, but coaches would be surprised that those exceptions are less than 1%. So, you know, if you've got 50% that aren't cutting it, it's not the sailor's problem, it's the coach's problem. So uh, it's a litmus test. Those objectives are litmus tests. And I'm not saying we're going to get it right every time. I don't get it right every time. But I try again the next day with something else that I think will work. Once I find something that works in my debriefing, I make sure that I note it and remember it the next time I teach it and use that as part of my approach. A little exactly. bit of accountability there and awareness for the coach as well. Go ahead. No, that's right. It it really um, relates to the goal settings that we are preaching quite a lot, both for the sailors and the both both for the sailors and the coaches. Um, right. And I think this is you're going to talk about it now, but um, um, the responsibility of of everybody. But um, yeah, the goal the goal settings is is super critical for everybody. Um, and it needs to be um, well designed for the sailors for its levels, for what, where they want to be in, in a year time, what's the next target regatta, and, and then work on your weaknesses. Don't, don't forget that. That's right. A lot of people level. tend to, yeah, a, a, a lot of people tend to work on, on their strengths because it's fun. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's fun to succeed. So macro level goals and objectives, micro level goals and objectives, 
uh, every day should have that, but it's important that it's measurable. And it should be measurable in terms of the process, not necessarily comparing yourself against somebody else or results at the end of a race. It's got to be in terms of the process, trust the process, trust the system, and you will become the best sailor you possibly can. And that's all we can ask is that somebody become the best self that they, they can be. And that's the coach's responsibility. But it needs to be observable and measurable. And so, uh, so that everybody involved knows where progress is happening and where opportunities for progress exist. Notice I'm being very careful to say, avoid talking about weaknesses and errors and problems. We're talking only about the performance that we desire and the performance that we want and opportunities to uh, make some changes to get them. So anyway, uh, I might be bursting somebody else's bubble here. You might've been told by your coach or even by your mother that practice makes perfect. That is not the case. Practice does not make perfect. It only makes permanent and it makes it automatic. So if somebody's practicing it wrong, they are remembering it wrong. They are learning to do it wrong. They are increasing the chance that they will do it wrong in the future. So we need to have something that intervenes in that practice to help that. And that's a combination of a focus target and feedback. It's that feedback loop that we talked about then with our example and our, our what good looks like wiggle and our checklist. So we need some feedback. And the more feedback we can get, the more loops we can get going, the quicker somebody uh, makes, makes a correction. Yeah, I mean, we're in sailing. Think about being off course one degree and letting it go for 10 days. That's a big problem, isn't it? If you make corrections each day and bring it back into the standard, uh, eventually you'll be able to keep it there. So that's... Just like in navigation, you need that feedback loop loop, and you need to be correcting to get it back to the standard. So be aware of that practice. Uh, now, of course, practice is much better than lectures. So you want to minimize lecture and maximize the effectiveness of your practice. Uh, more hands-on probably is better. And we know that that on the water time is very, very valuable, that on the water practice time. So there are some things that you can do. And once again, how can we use technology? Well, we can shift some of the lectures, explanations and presentations to online. That's what we've done at the International Sailing Academy. We've got an online video program based upon these principles. That's how I got pulled into this deal. Um, based on these principles, and uh, they can pretty much get the model, they can get the checklist, and they can get some, sometimes an elegant practice online. Think of all the time that set saves when you get your sailors together, ready to go out on the water. Now you can do some perhaps practice on land uh, while you're waiting to get on the water. And then once you get on the water, it's boom, 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 doing the, the drills and the, the routines that are going to achieve the objectives that eventually reach that level of performance that you're after. So in terms of awareness, what we'd really love to have is equivalent practice where we're racing all the time on the water. Unfortunately, that's not the most effective or efficient use of your time on the water. So you've got to find a way to make it more efficient and to compress the race situations into something that they can learn and practice and repeat. And that's where you get into other types of practice like analogous practice, doing it on land. We used to have a, a laser in the condominium where we had our breakfast uh, uh, the last couple of years. And we would start uh, our presentation or our lecture for the day by getting people in the boat and doing 10 simulated tacks right there in the living room on that laser. Uh, that's a lot more tax than that they'd be able to do out on the water uh, without getting really tired. Yeah. And so we had an opportunity to give people feedback, nip some problems in the bud, and give them a sound foundation to where they could go out in the water and do different 
uh, performances with different challenges, but nevertheless, we had eliminated, eliminated some and get ahead of the game by doing that. So analogous practice means you're either doing it somewhere else, you're doing only part of it instead of the whole thing. You're doing a simplified version, maybe with lighter wind uh, instead of heavy wind, doing a simulated version with whatever props you can get. We don't have very, very expensive props, but a boat in the boat yard is not bad or a main sheet in their hands or a, a tiller in their hands. And also a visual aid, visualization is a process that you can use too. And I put PETLEP in there. I'm not going to explain it, but it stands for seven things that you can do to make your visualizations more effective for sports situations. Yeah. People Google can that. Google it later if they want to. That's right. You can learn something new there. So out on the water, you have limited opportunities to give feedback. Another opportunity to give feedback and help to solidify the learning is after you get back. And that's where technology also comes into place. You can use your videos and your data points and use that uh, to help people learn from what happened and to solidify learnings or lessons and solidify their plans for improving in the future. So here are some just bare bones techniques. You can use this technique number one uh, at a micro, macro level with the whole group. You can say, what happened today? What did you learn? How can you apply those things tomorrow? Or you could show a video and say, what happened in this situation? Or you could say, what happened at minute one of this situation? Uh, what do you think they could have done better? What did you learn from? How will you apply that lesson? So just this simple format can help you dive into the big picture and the small picture in your debriefings. And let me tell you, it's, it's much more effective if you can draw these learnings out of your sailors rather than you being the, the, the fountain of all truth and knowledge, because they'll forget every word you say. They might remember what the what conclusions they said. that they came to. Yeah. Second technique is uh, once this is a, a great one for having people put in their journals and keeping things on the positive side and building confidence. So what are three things that went well for you today? What's one thing that you will improve tomorrow and how will you improve it? Uh, this was uh, taken from a sports psychologist by the name of Justin Sua. It's also mixed a little bit with a technique called motivational interviewing. I'll talk a little bit about that in the summary here. Here's an interesting one, uh, debrief technique number three. You ask your sailor on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being perfect, how do you feel about your tax today? Or how do you feel about this one that I just showed on the video? So you said a six, what makes you say a six instead of a four or five? So in this way, they get to say some of the positive things. At least I did this, this, and this, and that's why I get a six instead of a four. Uh, you can also switch it around. Why do you get a six instead, instead of a seven? And then you can ask again, what are you going to do? Or how, how are you going to raise it from a six to a seven or eight tomorrow? What are you gonna do different? So you get in these change conversations, once again, where it's coming from the student. Now, that doesn't mean that the coach can't suggest something or order something. This is just one technique, but it's a very, very powerful technique. So lastly, in terms, and also sort of a summary here, how do you use technology? Well, compass, GPS, uh, a lot of these things you can put on your boat are new sources or different sources of data. And they are just that, they're data points. Nobody should become completely dependent on anyone. You know, you don't wanna see a sailor looking at their compass the entire race, but it should be taken as a data point. And we certainly use them. I use a compass as uh, a, a training aid to help somebody that just can't keep a close hauled angle because they have no idea what their tiller is doing uh, or what the wave does when it hits them. And so we do some exercises with the compass and use that as a data point to help them catch themselves when things are getting a little zigzaggy. We use video for clear, exa clear examples. We talked about that. We use video for feedback. Uh, we use video for visualization exercises. We use online learning. 
in place of presentations, explanations, and examples. Uh, we use virtual coaching sessions where uh, we'll strap a GoPro on the back of a laser. They send the video in and a coach or two or the entire uh, laser community comments on what they see and gives them feedback on what they can do on, and also confirming feedback on the things they do great. Checklists are also a technology and they can be pe paper and pencil checklists. You put them in a plastic bag, tape them on the deck of a, uh, a boat and now you've got a feedback loop and they don't even have to memorize it. The coach can use it as well. And then low budget simulations, as simple as a boat or a piece of a boat uh, in a boat yard or in a living room. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think uh, in terms, I'm really excited about this business of learn and I've been tapping into, uh, like I said, sports psychology, skill acquisition, performance technology. These are just some things you can Google here, some books that I've found very useful. Coaching, coaching athletes to be their best, that's motivational interviewing. If you only read one book that'll change your coaching, that's probably it because that will really, really help you with the conversations and motivation issues with your uh, sailors. Fearless minds, confidence, coach's guide to teaching is that soccer coaching book that I talked about. If you can switch the, the point of view from soccer to uh, uh, sailing, that's gold right there. And then uh, Jonathan Fader's book, Life is Sport, will also give you a bunch of other ideas. That's pretty much it. I hope I hit your three questions there, Omar. I, I think you did, and I think you've done um, actually a lot more than just answering those questions. So thank you very much. For me, at least, it was um, a really eye-opener, and, and I'm into this for a while now. So, so thank you so much. This is really, really good and really interesting. Well, um, thanks so much for the opportunity. It's been my pleasure. Absolutely. I'll just stop the recording.